Welcome to a new episode of my High Performance Java Persistence video course. In this lesson, you are going to find out why JDBC logging is very important when using JPA in Hibernate, what configuration does Hibernate has to offer to customize statement logging, and why a JDBC data source or driver proxy is a much more flexible alternative to Hibernate logging. First of all, if you're working with JPA in Hibernate, then you need statement logging. Unlike plain JDBC, where you have absolute control of what statements are sent to the database, JP and Hibernate generate statements based on various entity state transitions, like persist, merge, or remove. If you don't use statement logging, then you'll never know what Hibernate executes on your behalf. And that's bad, because if you don't validate the auto-generated statements, you might bump into various data access performance issues. In this episode, you are going to see how you can automate the statement validation process so that your initial data access assumptions still hold even if, even if the application code evolves with time. Hibernate offers three log-based configuration properties, show SQL, format SQL, and use SQL commands. The first one, show SQL, is to be avoided. That's because it prints the statement to the console and for the same reasons you are using a logging framework, like log4j or logback, instead of printing to system out, you have to use a logging framework for Hibernate generated SQL statements as well. The second one, format SQL, can be used to print the SQL statement using a multi multi-line formatter. The third one, use SQL commands, causes Hibernate to annotate SQL commands with various commands, which can help you understand why a given statement was generated in a certain way. Behind the scenes, Hibernate uses JBoss logging framework, which acts as a bridge to the actual logging framework your enterprise application is using. So you can use any logging framework you want, like log4j or log4j2, logback via sl4j, or Java logging. Now, when persisting a post entity, Hibernate is going to output the following SQL insert statement. By default, statements are logged using placeholders. Later, we are going to see how to print bind variables as well. Prior to doing that, let's see what happens if we activate statement formatting. The format SQL setting takes effect prior to printing the SQL statement, so it's only applicable for Hibernate statement logging. It will not work if you're using an external statement logging framework. When you enable the format SQL configuration property and you persist the same post entity, you're going to see the following SQL insert statement printed in your log. If you enable statement commands, Hibernate is going to append various SQL level commands when generating the statements, like the entity state transition that triggered the current executing statement, the reason for choosing a join when fetching a given result set, or the explicit locking mechanism employed by the current statement. Unlike statement formatting, Comments are sent to the JDBC driver. Because it adds an extra overhead to the networking I.O., you don't want to leave this configuration enabled in a production environment. If you want to log the prepare statement bind parameter values, you have to add a new appender for the SQL type descriptor Hibernate package. Then, Hibernate is going to log both the type and the value used for each particular bind parameter. Even if Hibernate logging allows you to print both the prepare statement and their runtime bind parameter values, an external JDBC statement proxy is usually preferred. Either the JDBC driver or the data source can be proxied, and this way we can intercept any statement execution and log more than just the statement and its bind parameter values. Besides custom statement logging, a JDBC proxy can provide other cross-cutting concerns, like detecting long-running statements or validating the number of statements being executed. P6Py is an open source framework that supports a declarative configuration approach via an external properties file. You can use P6Py to proxy either the JDBC driver, which is very suitable for Java EE, or the JDBC data source, which is usually the case for Spring-based enterprise applications. P6Py prints more than just the SQL statement itself. It can capture the current timestamp, the statement execution time, the statement type, simple or batched, the database connection used by the current executing statement, 
the original statement with placeholders, the SQL statement where placeholders are substituted with bind parameter values. So, if we use p6py and persist one post entity, the statement is going to be logged as follows. Notice that the formatted statement includes the bind parameter values. Even the commit command is captured and sent to the log. Now let's see what p6py will log if we enable JDBC batching and we persist three post entities. p6py is going to log four statements. The first three are associated to the statement at batch method call. Hence, the value of batch in the statement type column. The fourth log statement is triggered by the statement execute batch method call. Hence, the value of statement in the category column. On the last log statement, the execution time is greater than the previous ones. That's because only after the three statements were batched at the JDBC driver level, Hibernate can execute the batch and send it to the database. Data Source Proxy is also an open source project which you can use to proxy the JDBC data source. If you're using Spring, setting up Data Source Proxy is just a matter of adding one Java bin config, which decorates a given data source with logging capabilities. For Java EE, it's much more difficult to use Data Source Proxy because the data source must be provided and managed by the application server. Another benefit of using Data Source Proxy is that you can supply your own custom statement execution listeners, like a statement count assertion mechanism. So, if you're using Data Source Proxy and you persist one post entity, the statement is going to be logged as follows. The prepared statement is printed along with the current executing bind parameter values. When rerunning the previous example, which was batching three post entities, Data Source Proxy will log the following message. We can see that the statement was batched and it took three sets of bind parameter values. And just like p6py, Data Source Proxy prints the statement execution time as well. Testing time. In my high performance Java Persistence GitHub repository, you can find a p6py test. Configuring p6py is very easy. All you need to do is to wrap the actual data source with the p6 data source decorator, which we can see here. Behind the scenes, p6py relies on the spy properties configuration file, which is located in our resources folder. And it looks as follows. Using the spy properties file, you can customize the way p6py works, like the logging framework of choice. Now, if we go back to our test and we are running the test batch method, we can see that p6py is going to log four statements. The first three were triggered by the add batch method execution. The fourth was written when the execute batch method was called. And that's it. It's actually very easy to use p6py. To see how data source proxy works, just to open the data source proxy test in my GitHub repository. This time, the configuration is done programmatically. As you can see here, the actual data source is wrapped by the data source proxy and we are using the SLF4J for logging the statements. Now, if we want to run the test batch, which inserts three post entities, we can see that data source proxy is going to log a single statement here. There are three sets of parameters that are being logged and that's it. Setting up data source proxy is actually very easy. Previously, I said that using a data source proxy is much more flexible than the default Hibernate logging mechanism. This is because when using a data source proxy, we can easily supply our own statement-based listeners and validate the number of statements being executed. Let's say we have two entities, a parent post entity and the post command, which has a many-to-one association to the post entity. Now, in our init method, we are going to add two posts 
and two post comment entities. And in our test method, we're going to run a single JPQL query, which is going to select all the post comment entities, and we can expect a single SQL statement to be executed. And that's exactly what we get. However, if some other developer comes in and tries to change the many to one fetch strategy from lazy to eager, and rerun the test, we can see now that the test is going to fail. And instead of one statement, three statements are going to be executed. The two extra secondary queries are executed because the post association needs to be initialized eagerly. And we can see that in the log. Here are the two extra secondary statements that were executed. Asserting the number of statements is extremely useful and advisable to do on every project that uses JPA and Hibernate. Just like you assert the number of comments being extracted, you should assert the number of statements being executed as well. This way, you can make sure that the code you are testing now is going to work the same when you deploy it into production. And if someone else comes in and changes the fetch strategy of your entities, you are going to be notified by the statement count validator because tests are going to fail. This works as follows. The SQL statement count validator relies on data source proxy query count holder, which counts all the statements that were intercepted. The reset method clears the select, insert update, and delete counters. For every SQL statement type, there is an associated assert count method. If the expected statement count is different than the one being recorded by the data source proxy, a Java exception is going to be thrown and the test will fail. After you execute a certain data access logic, you can validate the number of statements you expect to have been executed since the last time you called reset. So here you call reset, and here you assert the number of statements that must be executed. It's easy, yet very powerful. 